Hello and welcome to Conversations with Dr. Bachner. Once again, it is Howard Bachner, Editor-in-Chief of JAMA, and it will be vaccines, vaccines, and vaccines. I'm joined by two stellar, remarkable individuals, the first who's been on numerous times, uh, Paul Offit. Paul is the Director of Vaccine Education Center and a Professor of Pediatrics in the Division of Infectious Diseases at Children's Hospital of Philly. Philadelphia is a Maurice R. Hilleman Professor of Vaccinology at the Perlman School of Medicine. He is also on the advisory board, the FDA Advisory uh, Committee for Vaccines. The other is Bob Wachter. Ba Bob is an old friend, most famous as being the father of hospital medicine. Uh, Bob is, a pro is professor and chair of the Department of Medicine at UCSF, where he is the Holly Smith Distinguished Professor in Science and Medicine and the Benehoff Endowed Chair in Hospital Medicine. Welcome, Paul. Welcome, Bob. Thank you. So let's start uh, with uh, uh, an issue that has emerged over the last couple weeks. I think, Bob, you in part stimulated it with Ashish and a number of pieces in uh, popular press. And I think Paul has weighed in on that issue. So you just gave me the data, 30 million doses released, 15 million doses given, 15 million remain warehoused somewhere although the rate of providing the vaccines on a daily basis, shots in the arm are going up. And the question has come up whether or not, let's say we have 20 million doses more available on February 1. Should people get the second dose when they're supposed to, the Pfizer Moderna vaccines, three and four weeks, or should that second dose be held given to, uh, and, and not be given on time, spread out so another 10 or 20 million people who would have been getting their second dose those 10 or 20 million people should get their first dose. Bob, has, have I ca captured what you and Ashish were talking about? Yeah, I, I think the key, there are a couple of key points, Howard. One is that uh, we and, and no one credible I have heard is arguing that people should not get two doses. That, that, that part's clear and I think inviolable. Paul, I'm sure we'll agree with that. The second, and the reason that Ashish Shah and I wrote the piece in the Washington Post about this was, I was hearing too many people say we should stick with the plan because it's the plan. And uh, and and uh, I, I invoked in the article, I invoked the Mike Tyson principle, which is everyone has a plan until they're punched in the mouth. And it feels like we're being punched in the mouth. The rollout has been extraordinarily slow and sluggish. Uh, the surges are uh, huge and uh, now maybe beginning to plateau, but uh, 4,000 people a day dying of COVID and more than 9-11 every single day. And the, uh, the entry of the new variants into the mix in the United States increases the pressure to move things along. And so at least the models that I have seen raise the possibility that if you have a choice of vaccinating uh, tens of millions of people and getting more people to get their first dose sooner, and get them from 0% immune to perhaps 80 or 90% immune, you might save more lives than giving the exact same number of doses to people who will get from that 80, 85% immune to 95% immune with the second dose. Again, the argument is not to uh, give people only one dose. Uh, you need the second dose for, for, to get to 95% and for more durable immunity. But we were really trying to stimulate a conversation, get out of this box of just saying we should only do this because that was what was studied. Uh, the, you know, the efficacy of the first doses were also studied. It wasn't the overall intent of the trial, but we got, we have good data on, uh, on the level of protection that people achieve just before they received dose two. So, Paul, when you hear Bob present that, I can understand the argument. I think it's pretty simple that, you know, we have 20 million more doses on February 1 to give it to give rather than giving 10 million. Uh, that would represent second doses. Uh, 20 million people would get their first dose and those 10 million people would be spaced out, to, um, uh, you know, two months or three months. How do you react to it, Paul? Um, I, I think. It's largely a problem of messaging. I think the way people hear that is that is that one dose is 80 or 90 percent effective, which isn't true. And here's what we know. We know that that as as Bob said, 
when Pfizer did its trial, it gave a first dose, and then three weeks later, it gave a second dose. Well, there was time then to see whether or not people got infected between the first and second dose, and whether you were more likely to be infected if you got a placebo than vaccine. And what they found was that in that three-week period of time, the vaccine was roughly 52% effective. That with Moderna, probably because it was a longer period of time between dose one and dose two, it depended on how you sliced it, but there was at least somewhere in the vicinity of 80 to 90% efficacy in that four-week period of time. You also know that, that after one dose, you have an immune response, a neutralizing antibody response in your circulation that is considerably less than found after the second dose. You clearly get a, a booster dose with a second dose, and you get a T-cell response, depending on which company you were looking at. You either get a T-helper cell response in one company, or the other was T-helper cell and cytotoxic T-cell response, which suggests, as Bob alluded to, that you're going to have longer-term immunity. Not that you might have longer term immunity. You will have longer term immunity with that second dose. So if, if, if Bob is saying, let's get as many first doses out there as we can, um, and, and if it's a delayed a week or two, then at least you've vaccinated that many more people. And the second dose isn't given at three weeks, but four weeks, or instead of four weeks, it's five weeks. I don't have a problem with that. What worries me is that there are going to be people that, that are going to hear this and say, you know, I'm 80 to 90 percent effective. That's not that different than 95 percent effective. I got my dose. I'm good. I had to suffer a little bit with that first dose. Why well, bother? getting the second dose, that worries me, um, because they would clearly be less protected. Also, because there is a lesser neutralizing antibody response, you could argue, as virologists have, that you could be selecting for variants more if you have a weaker immune response than a stronger immune response after the second dose. So I, th I think Bob and I aren't that far apart as long as we both agree that you can't wait very long, because if you're talking about waiting, instead of waiting a week or two or three weeks later, you're talking about two months, three months, four months later, I think that's a problem. And there was just a, a paper, that, not a paper, but a news report that came out in Israel, and I think we need to look at the data more clearly, that they feel that that first dose was not nearly as effective as they hoped it would be, because now they're seeing sort of outbreaks in thousands of people where they hadn't expected that to happen when they had so many people that were given dose one. But again, one needs to look closer at that. I think I think I think the basis Bob's argument makes sense, with the exception of the fact that there would be people who don't get a second dose in a timely manager or worse manner or worse, don't get a second dose at all. Now, Bob, uh, it's a bit unfair. I, I mean, Paul is one of the world's leading vaccinologists. You are a scholar, but it's a bit uh, out of your field. But how do you respond to Paul? Well, I, I, I have to say that most of what I know about vaccinology, I learned from Paul. Right. So, so, <laughs> so uh, it, it is very hard to uh, to argue with him. And 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 I guess I have one question for Paul, which is that 52 percent figure about the efficacy of the Pfizer vaccine. Is that over the course of the entire three weeks, in which case it's integrated? That includes the first 10 days where you essentially have no protection. Because my impression, looking at the curves and the numbers, was the relevant number is not what your overall level of protection was during those first three weeks. It really is what was your level of protection the minute before you got dose two and that you were closer to the 80 to 90 percent range. So I'd love that clarified, but then I'll go ahead and answer your, your question, Howard. You know, I think that's right. And I think I think also with the with the, the Moderna, the reason it was higher, at least overall, was because you had another week. So so I think that probably drove it up as well. Just what worries me, though, is if you look at those phase one data, the level of neutralizing antibodies was clearly less and there weren't detectable T cell responses until you got that second dose. So you need that second dose. And I just this is really, to me, a messaging issue. I, I just to let you know what happened. I, I was on um, the PBS NewsHour like a week ago Friday. And when the Biden plan got announced as as, you know, we're going to get as many first doses out there as possible. I on the PBS NewsHour said, I, I think this is a this is taking a, 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 a unnecessary gamble because you're gambling. You're going to be able to have enough vaccine out there to get that second dose in a timely manner. Matter. And the next day, I was talking to David Kessler, <laughs> who said to me, this is who is now going to be the new Monsef Slaoui, I think, you know, he's going to sit, take over what I, I don't think it's going to be called Operation Warp no, Speed anymore. Not, but, right? but, yeah. So but he said, you know, this is not the plan. The plan is a two dose vaccine. And then that same day, Saturday, there were two people from the Biden transition team. Uh, one was Michael uh, Osterholm and the other was uh, Celine Gounder, who both got on TV and said, look, this is a two dose vaccine. You're getting it three or four weeks later because they feel they had a message, felt they had a messaging problem. So so yeah. that's the way it played out. Yeah. And I, 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 I guess I would say at, in that piece and in subsequent interviews I've done, I completely agree with Paul that if if the some t the modeling and, and as you say, Howard, common sense says 
that if you have a choice of giving more people that first dose, and if in fact you bring them to 80% or so protected, uh, you are probably better off than giving more people the second dose with a relatively small amount of incremental protection. But if that comes at the cost of people not coming back for their second dose right. because they heard the message that that's all I need, uh, that the reminder system somehow was good enough to get them to come back in three weeks, but somehow fails at two months, which of course is possible, that they see this as yet another curveball. And just like you told me that masks didn't work, and then you told me they did, and you told me I needed to clean my mail, and now you're telling me I don't, and I'm just so confused that I'm just not going to get vaccinated. And, and I'd say the mutant thing is yet another example. There are a number of uncertainties here that one would have to weigh in deciding whether this is a good idea or not. And Paul's very good at this and very smart, and I respect his opinion a lot. And it is not like uh, Shish and I wrote this and said, this is a slam dunk. It would be crazy for us to not follow this plan. It really was, I was just hearing too many people saying, this is the plan and we're going to do it because it is the plan. And it is. It, it really felt to us that it was a good time to take a step back and examine it. And, you know, the people in the UK are pretty smart. They're essentially facing the same problem that we're facing, right. except they're ahead of us in, the, in terms of the variants. So that they're, they're racing against a foe that is faster than the one that we are racing against today. And they did embrace this plan and, and with the same fact set that we have. I, I've not heard anyone say, and I don't know if Paul would say, that delaying the second dose a little bit would increase its efficacy in terms of getting you to 95% and getting you to more durable immunity. In fact, there are some people who say that it might even be a, a smidgen better, but I haven't heard anybody say it's worse. I haven't really heard a ton of people say that it's likely, and I'd love to fall away on this, it's likely that your immunity after the first dose is going to degrade a lot over the next month or or so, and maybe, but that may be an uncertainty, and, and certainly there's a possibility that, that there will be some degradation in the immunity. But I think Paul's argument, I hate to argue against myself, Paul's argument is a perfectly reasonable argument. If, if, and, and I sort of think you'd need to model this and maybe get sociologists involved and other people who study such things. If, in fact, people heard this and said, oh, what I am hearing, what I'm taking away from this is I only need one dose, that would be bad, and I would not be. I would not support this as an idea because the the implications of that really are are quite bad. I sort of believe there would be a way of messaging this so that you uh, you get more people vaccinated quickly. People understand the reason that we're doing it, and people still come back for their second dose. But that it does element it, it does introduce a level of uncertainty. But we're talking about an emergency, and we're talking about sometimes you have to do a little bit of improv. You know, the the defense has lined up in a different way. And, and, and the quarterback, uh, you know, calls a new play on the line. And so that was what uh, that was what we were reacting to, whether we really needed to think hard about shifting the strategy in a way to get more people vaccinated quickly because of the situation we find ourselves in. I think one of the points that uh, you made, Bob, is interesting to me, is that when we've shifted messaging in the U.S., it hasn't worked very well. Um, masking. Uh, uh, is is probably the most prominent, but there's been others about how much social distancing, um, schools opening, schools closing. Uh, it's not something we've done very well with. Now, there's a reason in part why that's happened, but I, I somehow think the, the populace knows one dose, a second dose, three weeks later or four weeks later, and if we move off of that, I don't know what the psychological I impact would be. And I think everyone is committed to a second dose. Um, and I, I don't know what would happen if that went out to six weeks or, or eight weeks. Paul, uh, co commenting, Bob had some other uh, comments or points that he made. I just wanted to interject this notion of, of changing pretty much how we've educated the public. Right. No, I think when you sort of change your messaging regarding a vaccine strategy. It's it's never good. I, you know, people get confused. I agree. Although one thing that Bob said, is, is, I think it's certainly true, is that there is not a vaccine that is given in, in, in multi doses where when there's a delay in that second dose or third dose, you ever need to start over again. I mean, we just always pick up where we left off. So I don't think there's likely to be a degrading of immunity. What worries me more is just that the first dose induces a lesser immune response. And I think there are problems associated with that lesser immune response. 
for the longer that you have that lesser immune response, I think the worse off you are. Bob, do you know, um, let, let's say it did go out to six weeks or eight weeks and someone then got uh, infected and died, would there be legal ramifications? Because currently Moderna, Pfizer, the EUA uh, recommends uh, a second dose very specifically. Do you know if there'd be legal ramifications if we lengthen the time between the first and second dose and uh, someone unfortunately became infected and then died? I don't know the answer to that. I, it's, a, it's an important question. It obviously would influence things. I, I think you would want the FDA to weigh in and say this is a reasonable and safe strategy uh, and endorse it. And I, I, I wouldn't recommend that people go out and do this on their own and choose to delay the dose uh, on their own. And I wouldn't even recommend that states embrace this without uh, a, a broader review by you know appropriate scientists who think through all of the the moving pieces and come to decide that this is the right thing to do as the UK has done. Bob, another question, then I'll turn to Paul. And we, we chatted at, at the beginning before we went live uh, about this. We've made it complicated. Phase 1A, phase 1B, phase 2A, 2B. I related the story of one brother who could get vaccinated. The other brother couldn't get vaccinated. I haven't been vaccinated. Have we made it too complicated, Bob? I think so. I, 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 so Ashish Jha and I had another editorial last week in the New York Times, and this one was on the complexity of the rollout. And I, I think what we had was a lot of well-meaning groups sit down and try to parse this around which groups uh, should be prioritized, and they're using ethical principles and redressing uh, healthcare disparities. All correct. All in a vacuum correct. But I don't believe there was a whole lot of um, a discussion about the practical implications. And I would frame it uh, this way. The someone stopping and saying, how the hell is this going to work? <laughs> and and, and I, I think what we've seen is the results of that. So I'll give you a couple of quick examples, Howard. Um, you know, they say that, OK, you know, people who are frontline essential workers are going to go should go earlier. I've been asking people for now months, tell me how Walgreens or CVS is going to figure out that you are a grocery store clerk or you are a preschool teacher. Is that a note from HR? Is that the honor system? You know, really? Is that, how's that going to work? Pre-existing conditions. Uh, I had thyroid cancer when I was a medical student at the University of Pennsylvania, 23 years old. I'm 63. I'm pretty sure I'm cured. Is that a pre-existing condition? I have a history of cancer. Who's going to figure that out? Is that going to be a note from the doctor? And the more we thought about it, we came to a general principle that I think is worth us reflecting on, which is systems, the more complex a system is, the less equitable it is likely to be. Who is going to be able to figure out their way around the system? Who's going to game it or who's going to have the resources and the wherewithal to get to the front of the line, it's going to be the well-to-do, it's going to be the privilege. That's, if, exhibit A is the tax code. And so what our fear was, was in, in, in a well-meaning, perfectly well-meaning effort to get the ethics right, we had created a monster, an absolutely unworkable mess of a system that was going to be confusing uh, 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 and ultimately inequitable, in a, <laughs> even though the goal was equity. So our recommendation in the Times was that we go back to the to the drawing board and say you start with start with the groups that we started with healthcare workers and people in nursing homes makes all the sense in the world and then start then go to age and 75 and up you're done with 75 and up 65 to 75 you're done with that group 55 to 65 very importantly because many of the deaths in communities of color uh, occur in younger age groups and so if you stop if your age cutoff is too high you may miss a lot of people from, uh, from disadvantaged groups and you may create inequities. The advantage of age is it's completely knowable. Uh, stores know how to card people. Everybody has identification that shows their age. When you're done with 55 and above, you go to a lottery. And the lottery is this week, uh, the number we pulled is a number three. If the last uh, date, uh, if the last number in the year of your birth is number three, it is your week, congratulations. You go and get your shot. Uh, what we said in the article is lottery, the lottery is the worst system except for all the others. 
It's fair. It's doable. Uh, old, we're old enough to remember the uh, the gas, uh, the oil crisis lottery in the 70s. And you could have made the same arguments, Howard. You could have said, well, I, you know, I have more of a need for gas because my commute's longer, my family's bigger, I'm poorer, my job is more essential. And we said, yeah, 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 here's how we're going to do it. Uh, last digit of your license is an even number. You get gas on an even day, odd number, an odd day. So it's a way of taking a very, very large pool and saying we're going to divide it up into groups of manageable size to prevent uh, overloading the system. The alternative is what happened to my mother, 84, in Florida yesterday, which is five hours in the car waiting in a huge parking lot for her vaccine, or people waiting on hold for three hours, or people trying to get onto the website and it crashing. And again, who's going to figure out their way around the system? Mostly the privilege. So that was the that was our sense. It's just become an unwieldy mess and in, in, in a perfectly well-meaning effort to get it right. Paul, when you hear that now, you're obviously your expertise is in the development of vaccines, but you are also smart enough to know if it doesn't make it to the patient. All of the extraordinary scientific advances over the last year uh, are wasted. Uh, do you think we need to try to make it simpler? Oh, definitely. I just think it's you know, there's not a clear right way to do it. it there is a Sophie's choice element to this. I mean, you you know, it, it's easy to say, for example, let's let's start with nursing home residents and, and staff because, you know, 40 percent of the deaths were in nursing homes and clearly vaccinating staff does make a difference. So that in many ways is an easy decision. And, and, and you can, you know, but when you get to the, the, the different gradations, say, for example, of, of physical health, it, it's, you know, it, it gets much more subtle and um, and you're, you're, and the lottery idea is an interesting idea, although it has because it's like a lottery for, for life. I mean, you know, the fact of the matter is uh, probably 100,000 and maybe 150,000 people are probably going to die over the next two months. What percentage of those, had they gotten a vaccine, would have had their lives saved? Probably most. And yet we don't have enough vaccines. So this, this lottery has that sort of Shirley Jackson, the lottery feel. Or when I was, you know, when I was uh, you know, coming into college and the, the had uh, was part of the lottery for the Vietnam War. I mean, I still remember my number. I mean, these were like life and death lotteries, which is kind of what this is. So my lottery number for the Vietnam War was 363. I remember it to this day. You obviously remember yours. 265. I'm, we, I'm, much, I'm much younger than you guys, so I <laughs> not remember mine. If, now, President-elect Biden, President Biden, as of tomorrow at 12 o'clock, I think, Eastern Standard Time, said 100 million doses in 100 days. That obviously depends on supply. He didn't talk about whether that meant 50 million people vaccinated or 100 million people vaccinated. Let's assume it meant 50 million. Um, there's been about 15 million people already vaccinated. Let's say we get another 15 million vaccinated. So that's 30 million and 50 million. That's 80 million over the next two and a half months. 100 million people should cover everyone older than 65, I believe. I have to do yep. the math a little more quickly. Uh, where does that where does that get us, Paul? A hundred so, million, say say uh, fifty million people plus the current thirty million. Say we have eighty million people vaccinated in the next two and a half months. Right, so ultimately, the the question you we want to answer is: what percentage of the population needs to be vaccinated in order to stop the spread of this virus. Yeah, that, um, there, there is a formula for this. It's in the the Plotkin's vaccines book under the community. Yeah, immunity. right, no, no, right. So, so without going into the details of it, when you have a, a highly effective vaccine like these first two mRNA vaccines of 95 percent efficacy, if you assume that's also close to the level of efficacy at preventing at least a lot of asymptomatic shedding, which I think is likely, although I think it may not prevent asymptomatic shedding, I think it will prevent the immunized person will shed virus less than would the non-immunized person asymptomatically. So, so let's assume that that 95 percent is close. And you assume that, that, that the 25 million people or so who've been said to have been infected in, in the U.S. or those who have been tested and found to be infected. But when you do antibody surveillance studies, you realize that's off by at least a factor of three and possibly more. But so let's say that 25 million is 70 million. So 70 million people, you're already at 20 percent of the right. population that, that's, that's immune enough that when they get exposed to this virus, they're not likely to get sick. So you're, you're starting with a base of 20 percent. So then what percent above that would you need to be uh, to be uh, 
to be have immunized or protected in order to say that you're going to stop spread. If you if you don't do that formula, you need about 55 to 60 percent. So it's total. So if you can, if but remember, we, we're vaccinating people who've also been infected. Right. So that's going to be 20 percent of those that are infected. So I would think that if you can vaccinate, say, 60, 65 million people um, with two doses, that I think we can stop the spread of this. And to do that, we need to be, be vaccinating at least a couple million people a day and probably closer to three million if we're going to try and stop spread of this virus by the summer. Bob, when you hear those numbers, and uh, and I, I was particularly interested in your scheme of uh, older than 75, older than 65, older than 55, um, and let's say the the focus is that that 50 or 60 million people, where's the light at the end of the tunnel for, when you hear the discussions? Is it April? Is it May? Is it June? Not for herd immunity, but where the number of patients at your two facilities will be minimal, or the number of hospitalizations in the U.S. won't be 180,000, but will be 10,000. Is that, do you think that's May or June or July? It all depends. It's a complete, it's a numbers game, Howard. So it completely depends on how fast we're getting people vaccinated. And I, you know, if you look at the number of people vaccinated versus supply, those uh, that difference is beginning to close. Right. So we always thought in December, we thought this was just going to be a supply problem. I don't think anybody dreamed, maybe Paul did, but I did not dream that it was going to be a last mile problem to the degree that it's been. But if you've been tracking those numbers, it's gone from about a week ago is about 28 percent of the vaccine doses that were out there had been injected. That number is closing in on 50. So I think we're pretty soon going to get to a point where it truly is a supply problem rather than a last mile getting it into arms problem. Then it's really a matter of, you know, what is the supply? And I think the the probably the biggest factor, there are two factors. One is the Biden administration comes in and really pushes on the manufacturing process for the two uh, for the two companies. And, you know, can they ramp it up at all by involving others to help? But the biggest one is, are there going to be one or two more companies in the mix? And if there are one or two more companies in the mix, we could have a substantially increased supply of vaccine available. We may find ourselves then back in the last mile problem again of now trying to distribute four vaccines. And now you got to figure out how to keep it straight, which one you got. And you're going to have another prioritization problem that may, uh, that may be even more complex than the ones we face so far. You know, up so up. I've been asked all the time. You know, should I get Moderna or Pfizer? I, you know, the answer is you should get whichever one you can get tomorrow. But if now they approve a vaccine that's seventy-five percent effective, not ninety-five, you're going to see a lot of jockeying about who gets which vaccine and where I go to get the vaccine I really want. So that's a long answer to say it all depends on the numbers and when we can reach. The reason the fifty-five cutoff is is important is it's about twenty-five percent of the U.S. population okay, who's over I couldn't remember. fifty-five. Okay, and it is, uh, and they represent ninety-two percent of the deaths. Right. So if we can get to that group, and and it it you know it is about 80, 90 million people, uh, you know, then plus the healthcare workers and nursing home uh, folks in nursing homes. So it's not inconceivable that we get there by you know by April or May. And you have decreased the deaths down to about 10 percent, not zero. But you see the curve, even though you have not reached herd immunity and there's still COVID in the community, you've seen those curves right. now plateau and really begin to come down. Now, um, Paul, I had Arnold Moreno on last week and he told me he had mentioned that both of the advisory panel meetings for January were canceled, which I think uh, meant that there was not yet another EUA application uh, for the committee to consider. Um, and I know, I believe there's two tentative meetings scheduled for February. Is there anything you can say about either of those meetings? Uh, technically, no. But, but what I would say is this. I mean, we're told, <laughs> we're, 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 that, that, those dates are communicated to us. We're always told to keep them confidential. But I'll say this. Um, <laughs> Well, we we don't when we meet when we are scheduled to meet there has to be a 15 day advance notice in the federal register so you'll know ah. a little more than two weeks in advance whenever we because it has to be announced um dr fauci said and he's close to the data um he said that 
for the J&J and AstraZeneca vaccines, he feels that, that we're going to be hearing those stories in February. So with, with vaccines likely released then by no later than early March. I think Bob's point about, you know, what to do if there's different efficacy levels. Um, I think the key thing, though, is, is efficacy against moderate to severe disease. I, I think what you're trying to do here is keep people out of the hospital and right. keep them from dying. That's the most important thing. If it were, you know, to the degree to which one, one vaccine may not be as good at preventing mild disease, I don't see it as that as big of an issue. Plus, Johnson & Johnson, if it's a single-dose vaccine, obviously that's an advantage. You know, we may be learning about some safety issues with mRNA vaccines that we don't know right now, that we may learn over the next few months. So, I mean, so there's there's always a, a, no, a number of other factors to consider other than that just 95% efficacy. So we'll see. Um, not don't you think, Paul, Paul, don't you think there is, if they come out and the and the the answer is it's 70 percent efficacious in the trials, I mean, how do you think that's going to play out? Because, yeah, yes, there are nuanced arguments about whether that's still good enough because it actually is 95 percent effective against severe disease or it's an older technology. So we're more comfortable with But what people are going to hear talk about messaging. They're going to hear my friend got 95 percent protected and I'm getting this 70 percent protective vaccine. And I, you know, I, I it's I'm getting a class B vaccine. How do you think it's going to play out? Well, it, it depends on the messaging. I mean, it may let's let's assume just for our argument's sake that Johnson and Johnson's vaccine is 85 to 90 percent effective against moderate to severe disease. I mean, that would be part of the messaging. It's a single dose. That's part of the messaging. You can get it. <laughs> that's part of the message. Right, that's the key I mean, thing. So and it's certainly much easier to transport. I, you know, the the you know when you look, for example, the Pfizer, especially the Pfizer efficacy trial. I mean, that was an efficacy trial, right? It, under under highly controlled conditions. Now it's out in the real world. This vaccine that has to be shipped stored in dry ice that has basically a five-day life in the refrigerator and a six-hour life once the, 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 the rubber stopper is violated. I mean, I'd like to see whether the effectiveness is the same as the efficacy in the real world. So, so all those things factor in, but we'll see. Um, yeah. uh, Paul, two quick questions. Uh, we mentioned it early and it has come in. Um, Moderna adverse reactions in a single facility. I, if you just can briefly comment on that. Right. So, so you're missing the critical piece of information. You, you know that there were 330,000 doses as part of this lot. You know that in one of the, the many facilities, in which it's been this vaccine has been distributed there was a problem the problem is that within 24 hours people had come back with a medical problem at least it's not clear to me from what i've read and maybe you have more information or bob has more information on this than i do that what specifically were those problems why was it just one facility what what ended up happening though the messaging here since that seems to be the theme of this was was to withdraw the, the lot so the messaging was the hot lot i mean there has not been a hot lot of vaccines since since the Cutter incident in 1955. I mean, the, the, that was the birth of consistency lots. I mean, these lots are consistent from one lot. That's what the FDA does best, really, is to make sure that those productions are consistent. So the notion that, that this is a bad lot is a bad one. Also, you know, when they, they withdrew it in a time when we need vaccine and they said we're exercising an abundance of caution, it's not a risk free choice. I mean, over the next six weeks or eight weeks, a lot of people are going to die. No doubt. Some of them who could have gotten this vaccine and we don't even know what these medical problems were. That it was just in one facility. I think that was a bad decision, frankly, to take that to take that essentially that off the market. The story in Israel is is fascinating. They've reached a much uh, larger percent of their population, I believe, than any country in the world. I, I mean, we're hovering at three or four percent. I think as of this morning, they're somewhere between 25 and 30 percent. But now there's been some early reports that they're concerned about how effective the Pfizer, Pfizer vaccine is in their population. And in fact, Paul, this may go to the point you just made. There's a difference in a randomized clinical trial where everything is so closely controlled versus shipping it, dethawing it, administering it. Um, do either of you have a any sense of what we will learn from Israel? I'll let Paul take that, I think. Right. I, th I think because they're they're so far ahead of us they're much better organized at, at getting at manufacturing distributing and getting it out there um i think we will learn a lot i think that that that, that country will probably be the first to teach us about efficacy both for for what the, the efficacy is with the single dose um and and then what the efficacy is with the second dose i think that that's probably the country that's going to teach us the most about what it means to have some delay between that first and second dose and we'll learn about the effectiveness of, of the a two-dose vaccine in in the real world 
Um, and that'll be valuable information. And we'll learn also about safety, which, which we, we constantly have to keep our eyes open to. I mean, this is the, the mRNA technology is a novel technology. I think we have to be humble at, at making sure, at knowing that there may be things we don't know that we're going to learn. Yeah, and I'd add that uh, you know the most important thing we can learn is logistics. I mean, they have figured out how to get vaccines into people's arms, you know, much, much, much faster and better than than we have. And I think it's a little too facile to say it's just because they're small, because in many ways, you know, we're, we are a big, complex country, but much of the allocation is to local jurisdictions. It's to the city and county of San Francisco or to the state of or the state of Arkansas. You know, these are relatively small units that in some cases are no bigger than Israel. And we are massively behind them. So I, you know, I hope the Biden administration is watching because there's something that they have done in terms of the logistics, the messaging, the support that they, they have given to local uh, uh, districts and, and, uh, and regions and hospitals and pharmacies uh, to have the right systems, the right computer systems. Uh, this is something we just didn't do. We, you know, we put a huge amount of energy and resources into developing the vaccine and we just kind of spaced on the last mile problem and the point Paul has made many, many times is that until it's in people's arms, it, it's not doing any good. So I hope we learn, uh, we learn lessons, not only from Israel, but if you look at the vaccine distribution in the United States, uh, my state, California, has given out about 35 percent of the vaccines that are currently in freezers. Texas is close to 60. West Virginia is 70 or 75 right. percent. So we should be learning from each other. You know, for better or worse, mostly worse, we're doing 50 natural experiments. We, we should be learning about what works. Yeah, it's interesting that rural states have generally done better than uh, so-called urban states. Last question to you, Bob, and then I have one last question to you, Paul. Bob, you chair a major department of medicine. Um, how, how has the rollout of vaccines gone at UCSF and then in the surrounding healthcare facilities in which you provide care, particularly skilled nursing homes? I think it's gone extraordinarily well at UCSF. And, and part of my argument with Ashish for a lottery was because we did a version of that. Uh, the first thing we did was we divided up our population of, of people who face have patient facing work uh, into four big groups in terms of the amount of potential COVID exposure. And, and that was a little bit contentious and because the HR systems were not designed to do this. So right. we had to go in and parse the list and the buckets were pretty big, 6,000 people in group one, 10,000 people in group two. Once we did that, the allocation then was by a lottery, it was essentially by random choice. So once I, I was in group one because I was starting on the wards as the hospitalist in a few weeks. Uh, and once I knew I was in group one, I would go to my email every day and wait for the magic email. And I waited about six days. The first person who got his vaccine at UCSF was one of the members of our custodial staff. And I thought that was spectacular. Uh, our CEO of our medical center, our chancellor, uh, still have not been vaccinated because they they did not come up because they are not doing patient facing work. So there was a lot of attention to equity. There was a lot of attention to who really needs it. We were religious about, you know, the donors, the VIPs do not get to yeah. get a place in line, do not cut the line. And I think, you know, the, the quality of the rollout shows a lot about the values of an organization. There were a lot of reports of rollouts in big academic medical centers that went poorly. Uh, you've probably read about the problems at Stanford where the residents were cut out because of the, the way the algorithm played out. There were problems at, at Mass General uh, because it, it, was, it was a first come first serve system and the computer system crashed. There was a big article in the Times about some of the problems in some of the New York hospitals where there was some line cutting. And, 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 and I don't wanna be critical of any of those systems because this was, it turns out to be hard. But what they demonstrated to me is if multi-billion dollar hospitals and health systems trying to vaccinate their own people who have, they have a robust HR system, robust computer systems, and it's this hard, how are we gonna make this work when we're trying to right. vaccinate 300 million people in, in pharmacies? So it just demonstrates how incredibly complex this is, but I think we did pretty well. Yeah, no, it may, made me reflect on your comment about if we can make at least a criteria simpler the likelihood of success becomes greater. Paul, yeah. the last question to you, um, the variants, there's now been a number reported. Uh, Rochelle asked me not to refer, that, refer to them by the name of the country 
because she worries that it's stigmatizing. I, of course, could never think of the long numbers. But do you just want to comment on the variants and then uh, the variants vis-a-vis the vaccine? Then we'll stop. Right. And if you know the numbers, you can use the numbers. I can't remember the numbers. All right. So so there right now are three variants that we're looking at. Um, the, the, the one of them was from a country that gave us a T tax. I don't know if you remember that, but that That's was good. A while okay. Ago. Um, we can go with that. We became independent of that country eventually. <laughs> we won't mention its name. The variant is B117. But Thank you. The, the key question, the, the, what you want to do is you want to identify these variants as quickly as possible. I think, as Bob alluded to earlier, we need to be much better at sequencing these viruses in this, in this, in this country, in our country, and, and try and duplicate what's happening in, in the UK, where they are much better at sequencing, so that we can identify these variants when they come up. When they come up, what we need to identif- do initially is to see whether or not the sera that are obtained from people who are immunized with these mRNA vaccines neutralize that virus. That's what you need to know. So with the U, with that 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 UK variant, what you what you have is you have uh, Phil Dormitzer from from Pfizer stepping forward and saying we have looked at serum that we obtained from people who were immunized with two doses of Pfizer's vaccine. It neutralizes that virus. Good. Now that 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 should be reassuring. Um, we don't yet really have a clear immunological correlate for protection against disease, but that is reassuring. Then there's this South African variant, and you're going to be hearing about this a lot in the next two days because I just saw the preprint of this, this, and so this is what you're going to hear. Um, when they took Sira, South Africans took Sira, and then from people who were convalescing from the infection to see whether or not it neutralized this particular variant, which is different than the UK variant, what they found was that half of the Sira didn't neutralize it. So of the 44 sera or so that they tested, 22 did not neutralize that virus. Now, there were, there were a, a handful of sera that did neutralize it completely. Those were the sera that were obtained from people who had more severe disease and had higher titers of neutralizing antibodies in, their, in, their, in, in convalescence. So, 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 but that's not the critical question. The critical question is, does the, the people who were vaccinated, vaccinated develop right. neutralizing? Because the, the vaccine may induce higher, longer lasting titers than people who have a convalescent, who are convalescent, which can have, a, I think, a broader range, frankly, of, of, uh, of uh, neutralizing titers just because they have different levels of disease. So, so at least the, the vaccination is always the same, right? 30 micrograms, 30 micrograms for Pfizer, 100 micrograms, 100 micrograms for, uh, for Moderna. So that's the critical question. That's what you want to see. And I don't understand why it takes us so long to do this. I mean, the South African and Brazilian variants were isolated a while ago. Just just maybe it's the companies have not been great at, at, at either allowing people to look at those sera or testing them themselves. But that's what you want to hear immediately from these companies. Do those sera, polyclonal sera, neutralize those uh, those those uh, variants because what people tend to do is they use monoclonal antibodies because they're they're available and and you know and it's more fun I think for the researcher to see exactly where is that variant you know where where has it drifted away from from the non-variant strain but what you really want to know is do the neutralizing antibodies generated by vaccination neutralize these viruses that's what you want to know and we don't know that yet frankly for either of these two other variants the South African or uh, Brazilian. But we will know that. I think we'll know that soon. And then if that's a problem, if it really does it's completely escape uh, neutralization by um, by the, the vaccine, then what, what you want to see is whether or not vaccinated people are infected with these viruses, because that's really where the, where the, where the that's where the proof is in the pudding. Because right now we're assuming that the neutralization titers are, are predictive of, of whether or not uh, you're protected. But it may be T helper cells, cytotoxic T cells. Um, you know, Shane Crowdy, when he did his work looking at who how people recovered from natural infection, found that really all three of those neutralizing antibodies t helper cells cytotoxic t cells were all important so that's that's the ultimate thing i mean and, and if that's true if people who are in, vaccinated with these these with these mrna vaccines who then exposed to these variant viruses get sick then we're going to have to to have essentially a multivalent vaccine strategy where it's not just for example one mrna in there but it's the mrna from not the non-variant strains but also the variant strains and that's going to be nightmare this is Howard Bachner, Editor-in-Chief of JAMA. What a pleasure. I've been joined by uh, Paul Offit, and Paul is a Maurice Hillman Professor of Vaccinology at Perlman, and Bob Wachter. Uh, Bob is a Holly Smith Distinguished Professor in Science and Medicine and the Benehoff Endowed Chair in Hospital Medicine, and uh, is often referred to as the father of hospitalist medicine. Uh, not the grandfather, Bob. I won't uh, make you I, that I old. Never. 
<laughs> um, uh, thanks to the two of you for joining me today. It's always a wide ranging and enjoyable conversation. And stay healthy, both of you, please. Thank you. You too, Howard. You too, Howard. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.